At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Nick Ortil, presenting Transitioning to the SOSA slash CMOS Architecture. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Nick Ortel, uh, VP of Engineering, QRC Technologies. Um, we deliver RF-based integrated solutions for government, military, and law enforcement agencies. And these products and solutions address a wide range of signal conditions. Uh, that's my contact information. Uh, I think the organizer said it would be made available after the conference. So I plan to cover uh, in a few slides the journey from going from a standalone solution to a CMOS integrated solution, some high level design considerations. Uh, also, going to cover um, an RF survey use case, the means to illustrate uh, future revisions of specification that may um, make some sense to have uh, unfold uh, to allow plug in cards to plug in cards to interoperability. Um, I realize there's now a proposal uh, for, to accommodate this type of functionality um, for several of the technical committees, but uh, that was a known this paper was put forward in June. So uh, uh, apologies if some of you think this is a little OBD. So uh, on the left side is a uh, classic black box um, convection cooled standalone system, uh, self contained two tuner, uh, two software defined radio tuner. Survey solution contains power supply, removal media, processors, and so on. On the top of the box is the core technology, the software defined radio, and the SOSA compliant three to form factor. Then on the right side, just a few pictures of, of the journey along the way, you know, digital engineering all the way to the prototyping. The uh, taking a look from a functional block diagram perspective, um, Standalone product on the left and the SOSA CMOS compliant on the right. Uh, you notice that there are far few functional block diagram uh, components on the right. The reasons are pretty straightforward. Uh, the chassis provides power, communications, uh, buses, and um, various other plug in cards provide things like storage and so on. And therefore, the, for us, the effort was to focus on really our core technology and not. Um, all the other things you needed in the system to make it work. I, I, I think if I, I know you're probably difficult reading little words, that's okay. It's really the colors to look at, you know, number of lots in colors, so very few transition over in terms of the course and sustainable. Uh, taking a look at this from a physical point of view, um, you can see the high level assembly on the left and the number of parts, you know, several hundred that go into the box. And essentially, uh, in the sense of CMOS form factor, uh, quite a few um, newer components, uh, essentially a three-layer board stack and just a standardized connector and so on. So it makes it pretty, um, made it pretty straightforward for integration. Uh, really what I want to talk about though is a, a use case. Um, so here we have, um, well, I, I should back up and just say, so as we did a use case analysis, we started looking through all the use cases we have, and you know, many can be accommodated with standard CMOS card, no question about it. Um, but but as our RF survey gets a little more complicated, I'll illustrate in a moment for different use cases. Uh, there may be some accommodation that can be made in order to uh, process some of the signals. So in this case, uh, pretty straightforward. We're going to set up a perimeter. Um, we're going to look for things coming RF things coming in and out of the perimeter. In this case, we we'll just pick something that's kind of in the public uh, domain now, uh, consumer UASs. So, uh, you know, in a standalone sense, you'd have a, a box or two, a uh, classic black box or two, and an antenna that would allow you to locate the signals and controllers. In the CMOS sense, you'd have the chassis, a few cards, and, they, and of course, an antenna. So, functionally, about the same. Um, not a lot of difference there. So we've established the perimeter, uh, pretty straightforward. You can identify the, the drone and controller um, on both systems. But not that uh, challenging to do, done every day. However, I think here's where we start to get into a little more complexity. So as the environment starts to ramp up in complexity, let's just say there's multiple consumer drones in the area. You not only want to maintain real-time detection, identification, location, but you might want to also simultaneously transmit as well um, and have some other features of the system. 
um, such as automatic gain control and other things. That's when you start taxing the present system. Um, easily, we'll exceed a gigabyte a second of inbound data that needs to be processed in addition to the other tasks that are going on, uh, like visualizing, learning, tagging, storing, transmitting. So um, that's where latent seals start coming into this thing. Um, and the concept of real time might um, be less than you're willing to get, uh, put up with. Oops. So, one way um, to alleviate this would be to allow for uh, thick interoperability. And so, what do we mean by that? Uh, actually, have the cards be able to talk to each other directly off the bus. Um, you know, to relieve a lot of the processing that way. Certainly offloading the chassis you could even uh, double the throughput of the system. If we had think of it as little modules, so we'll have two cards, three cards potentially put together, um, interfacing with each other directly to um, process the high data rates. The, um, there's other use cases as well that this could be useful in. Um, there are use cases, and I put this in the paper, where you could have two chassis that are separated by quite a distance. Um, and, and there's uh, reasons that you'd want each chassis to kind of be independent from each other, but then again, talk to each other to exchange information. And uh, again, run into some serious latency if you can't accommodate things like uh, eight lanes, ETIE, and so on. Uh, we think this can be accomplished um, by maintaining uh, by, and maintaining the main chassis, larger system, uh, um, things like the SOSIS uh, requirements and the interfaces and the ICDs. And then I, I just, as an example of this, to show that it has been done in other places, I uh, just put in a consumer computer card. Um, to show that, yes, they maintain their ICIDs and interfaces. However, um, they do also allow for um, a little richer user experience by jumping into your card. And, uh, and obviously, swap would not be able to act by the end. So, again, I, I realized that there was a proposal to accommodate this type of functionality um, probably in July, August uh, timeframe. And so uh, that was a little ahead of this paper. So, um, so that's it. That's all I wanted to present to the audience today. Do we have any questions for Nick? Okay, nothing's coming on. Oh wait, here we go. Here we go. Um, the, here's a question. The last slide mentions intraoperability, but you show two cards. Yeah, I just. Um, I, guess I just took a consumer example. Um, I think in a previous slide I lined up three cards, um, which is, uh, and when you said inter or in, intra or inter, uh, what I'm talking about is interoperating between two cards or three cards or more to the front, not necessarily to the back. And so I tend to think of that as a module, um, if you will, like you take two or three cards because you want to achieve something, put it together. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Nick.